Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to welcome you to our conversation today on Putin's foreign policy and Russia's long-term interest, a discussion with Mikhail Kasyanov, the former Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Russia. Welcome. Welcome to Washington. We're delighted to have you here. The, the relevance of today's discussion is really driven home by the crisis in Ukraine today, and I think we'll focus on that this evening. Uh, we'll focus on trying to better understand Putin's destabilizing actions in Europe's east and what that means inside Russia as well. But the origins of today's conversation trace back to last fall when our, our guest of honor, uh, as well as his introducer, David Kramer of Freedom House, uh, and I, the three of us, were on an island in the Baltic Sea having a debate on the future of Europe, the future of Europe whole and free, in fact, and where Russia's place was in that vision. Um, it was challenged even then by Russian foreign policy actions in Europe's east. Uh, we had pointed conversations even on Crimea at that particular time that were unfortunately eerily pres prescient. Um, but it was then that Mikhail Kasyanov raised the idea of coming to Washington and speaking about an alternative Russian foreign policy view. Uh, so tonight we'll have a chance to focus in this context on Ukraine today and what it means. To kick us off, I'm going to invite David Kramer to the podium to introduce our guest today. Um, David was part of those conversations, but he's also a, been a longtime voice in Washington's debates on Russia itself. The president of Freedom House, David, is a former top State Department official dealing both with Russia and Ukraine, but also served as Assistant Secretary for Democracy. Um, let me invite you to the podium, David, please. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Damon. It's a real honor and privilege to be here and to introduce my good friend Mikhail Kasyanov. Um, I, I will be very brief because you're not here to hear me, you're here to hear from uh, Mr. Kasyanov. But I, I do want to stress that I think the current crisis underscores that how a regime treats its own people is often indicative of how it's going to behave in its foreign policy. Thus, we shouldn't be surprised when we see Putin supporting uh, Bashar Assad in Syria and the slaughter of the Syrian people. Nor should we be surprised when we see Putin trying to block efforts by his neighbors to move in a more Western direction, to try to democratize, to try to move toward political liberalization, respect for rule of law, respect for human rights, all, all the things, frankly, that are anathema to Vladimir Putin. Um, these uh, are, are examples where we see in the latest crisis Putin professing concern about the welfare of ethnic Russians or Russian speakers or whatever phrase you want to use in Crimea and in Ukraine um, when he doesn't give a damn about the welfare of Russians living inside Russia itself. So the paradox, I think, is, is quite striking. The situation inside Russia, perhaps not focused on as much in light of the current crisis, is getting uglier by the day, and it was already a very ugly situation. Just in the past couple of days, we've seen legislation being considered that would require bloggers who have more than 3,000 visitors a day to register with authorities. A possible travel ban on police officers and other law enforcement authorities. Further uh, uh, penalties for participating in unsanctioned demonstration or publishing information that's deemed as harmful to the Russian government or the Russian military. Uh, Mr. Durov has just left the country, the latest among many Russians who have decided that the situation is untenable for them to stay there. The second highest number of asylum seekers comes from Russia. Uh, professors getting dismissed for voicing criticism of the current situation in Ukraine. Uh, Alexei Navalny, the latest conviction for him yesterday. And then uh, uh, we just heard that uh, Parnas, the party, has run into its latest setback in a court decision uh, just today. Fifth column and national traitors. This is the term that Putin used in his speech on March 18th. Um, and this is eerily reminiscent of Soviet rhetoric and Soviet language. But I must say that I'm very proud to be here today with one of those people who's now been identified as a national traitor. Uh, Mikhail Kasyanov, who uh, is called that because of his bravery and his courage. Because it is easy for people in the United States, including myself, to stand here or to write uh, columns and articles that criticize Putin and his behavior and his actions. It is so much more difficult 
for people living in Russia to speak out and to criticize and to offer alternative views. Uh, we've seen turnout of impressive numbers a few weeks ago, 50,000 people protesting Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. Uh, but there are also political leaders that have to step up and have to muster the courage against serious threats of harassment, arrest, uh, detention, uh, possibly worse. And sadly, there are far too many examples of that. So for those who criticize the Russian opposition for being too disunited, for being feckless, for being unappealing to Russian voters, put yourself in their shoes for a moment and think about how you would act if you were in their situation. So it does take a very brave soul to speak out these days against Vladimir Putin. Mikhail Kasyanov is one of the leaders in doing so former prime minister in Russia from 2000 to 2004, minister of finance before that, currently co-chair of the Republican Party of Russia, uh, freedom, uh, People's Freedom Party, Parnas, uh, and one of the most consistent and brave and courageous uh, critics of Vladimir Putin. It is my honor to introduce Mikhail Kasyanov. Thank you, David. Thank you, Damon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today, here in Washington this afternoon, and to, to, to share my views on uh, uh, foreign policy, alternative foreign policy, what we, on that Baltic island, we wanted to discuss in lens here in Washington to describe to you how we could deal potentially in a, in a um, uh, brighter future with the different, different challenges uh, taking place from time to time in different corners of our world. But today, unfortunately, the situation is squeezed so much and uh, the whole world in, is being concentrated on uh, some events, Russia-Ukraine relations. I would start just of saying that a few years ago we had, we had some kind of, we have some kind of deterioration on international arena too. Uh, I mean, several times Mr. Putin stated that uh, newly established states on the territory of former Soviet Union, new independent states, uh, had not quite full legitimacy, not just quite full, I would say, sovereignty. And uh, he promised that if he would uh, feel that something should be changed there, that he would step in. And in fact, it happened soon when after 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, when two countries like Georgia and Ukraine just wanted their applications to be considered there on the summit to join this organization and they didn't get appropriate answer. A few months after Russian troops invaded territory of Georgia. And that was a real disaster. There was a real war, a lot of casualties. And uh, there was a special plan designed by European Union with the support of the United States, designed for, for regulate, to regulate all, the, all these activities, all these problems. And it happened so that a few months after, uh, business turned to be as usual. And French government continued to, continued to implement so-called mistrial contract with the military equipment. German companies consolidated and pressed their government just to continue to getting uh, profitable contracts, uh, etc. The whole world forgotten about this undertaking at that time. And Mr. Putin understood that it's absolutely right that the West is weak, their leaders just cynical, and they thinking only about their elections, and uh, him, he could perform in that manner he wanted. And uh, having in mind that his legitimacy is on doubt, because just elections were not recognized and free and fair, at least by European Parliament and by Russian opposition, he feeling the lack of legitimacy inside the country, he needs to draw this legitimacy outside. Initially, that was just, I would say, kissing and hugging sessions with European and other leaders. But these days, it's a little bit different. 
he created another consolidation uh, tool, like uh, external enemy. And having in mind that West is not consistent in uh, implementing the promises, implementing the, I would say, pursuing the tough policy vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis violators, especially human rights violators, uh, what this Putin's regime is about, and the European Court of Human Rights is full of different claims from Russian citizens claiming just for their violation of their, of their rights. And having this in mind, just that became absolutely clear that Putin is free of any for any activity. He got a special ticket issued by the West for undertaking those efforts and such uh, an activity. Um, today, what we have now, Putin again thought before making this decision on Ukraine and Crimea, he thought that uh, the West again would digest everything he could undertake and will continue to have lip service to so-called universal values. Only, and only and, and the paper, it sounds such way that all politicians elected in their countries devoted to universal values, but in the practice, when it when, and, and, uh, happens with Russia, they don't perform this way, they don't criticize enough uh, Russian government for not implementing its international obligations. Uh, today, the situation appeared to be a little bit different. Mr. Putin and his team, they didn't expect that the West would react so immediate manner and such, a, I would say, with effective measures. Effective measures means individual targeted sanctions. Me and my party, we for such sanctions. That sanctions not against people of Russia. That are sanctions not against the Russian Federation, our state. That's the sanctions against those people who wanted to destroy European security established after the Second World War. And in fact, I would say these sanctions are already bringing appropriate effect. It's not, it doesn't look like already just some changes on the place, but it is an effect. And these people who already, there's few people there only, but these people already creating some kind of atmosphere inside. And through even, I even, even feel this through my friends abroad, who got some kind of contacts with the, or those oligarchs, or other people just got the contacts with them, and these foreign friends just already approaching to me. What will be next, whether just other uh, state officials, government officials, and the leaders of state corporations will be put in another list? And the answer, my recommendation would be for US government, of course, tomorrow. That's the major undertaking should take place these days. Immediate enlargement of the list, of this black list of sanctions. That's a very effective measure. I, I, and I would prevent of uh, continuing further on now discussing and uh, uh, promising uh, just to implement tomorrow sanctions against Russia. Me, when I was a finance minister, when I was prime minister, I fought it with your politicians for many years just to stop application of vaccinogenic amendment. And finally we got it, together with adoption of another individual sanction list, Magnitsky list. It's absolutely the right decision. And that's new technology, 21st century. We should not punish people, just nation. We should punish those violators. Violators of human rights or violators of uh, European security. That's the way we should go. And that will bring appropriate fruit. Definitely would do. Secondly, my feeling is that the regime is being already on the way for, for death. With the, such a situation we have now, I mean, I mean economic environment. That's already inevitable that the regime will collapse. But with the, such a, a situation what we have now, that would add and speed up this process uh, definitely. Uh, why I see and I uh, 
analyzed this way. First, we already, for the period of a year and a half, we don't have growth of industrial output. Already more than six months, we don't have GDP growth. First two months, of this year already shown that GDP already declined, although just the quarter figure was announced by the government just a little bit higher than zero, but it's already, already declining. And international reserves of central bank, while they look like a huge, like 477 billion US dollar, but in fact, that is not enough to keep the whole country to, 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 to live in the same style what we have now. All biggest cities in Russia right now live on imported products. Moscow, St. Petersburg, Ekaterinburg, Nizhny, and others and others, just all food, 90% of food is imported. 90% of, of medicine imported. And it would mean if the, the, the reserves are not enough that a normal import would not be available for, for, for people. Moreover, Russian state debt, while it's not quite high because we managed to, to solve this problem with your assistance and other countries in the past, but corporations already borrowed a lot. And they need rollover. That's approximately 300 billion of uh, debt of those corporations. And uh, if, if the, the, the international banks will not be so eager to make this rollover. Not under the sanctions, under instruction, but under soft recommendation. First, the borrowing will be much higher, much more expensive, and not available for everyone. It means that immediately just approach to the Western capital markets would be necessary. And without government support and, uh, of the United States government and the government of, of European Union, it would not be possible to obtain appropriate funds. As soon as Russian government, Mr. Putin, feels this, that will be immediate change. Right now, he is bluffing, thinking that you are not consistent enough and will not pursue this policy. He was shocked when he knew that European Union adopted those sanctions. He was absolutely sure that Germany would never allow, German industry would never allow its government to adopt such sanctions. But he made a mistake. Solidarity, which we see just and appreciate it very much, shows that not everything in this world tradable, as Mr. Putin thinks and believes. I think we have a very good opportunity, first, to, to, to resolve the problem with Ukraine and Crimea, and secondly, just to, to tackle the, the problems in, uh, in Russia. Uh, what my recommendations would be on, uh, on, on Ukraine. On Ukraine, first, the, the Western community should ensure that May 25th announced elections takes, take place and uh, uh, run successfully. And the results are credible. Elections are free and fair under, under supervision of um, OECE and uh, all necessary organizations making their reports, and that will be visible for everyone that everything is all right. That's absolutely necessary for stabilizing situation there. Secondly, Ukraine needs immediate refinancing of their debts. IMF, of course, would provide the first tranche, 1.1 billion, just to refinance its own debt. But there are many other creditors. Of course, usually all assistance could be provided under, under special, special promises of the government and the package, but one year, one year standby and another package absolutely possible so that to allow the government to stand up, to be strengthened and to walk out this, the, the set of reforms supported by the whole world. This is absolutely necessary. And the third one, that of course, of course just the help, moral help for Ukrainian government and Ukrainian people in their, in, their, in their fight for their sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, important point also on Ukraine is just to help them to ease, 
uh, dependence on, on gas supplies from, from, from Putin's um, uh, corporations. It means just uh, to trying to reverse gas supplies from uh, the European network, which already the testing operation already took place successfully. I think that's also, also uh, it's very good. For Russia, in terms of Russia, as I said, first direction, that is absolutely uh, weakening of uh, cohesion of ruling group by individual sanctions that will absolutely bring effect. Second, that to create conditions for energy, to, to ease energy dependence of um, uh, European countries. It means, it means alternative sources of energy, and uh, we know that leaders of European Union already gave instruction to, to the Commission to produce a special program by the end of May, so that within a short period of time, diversification of supplies could take place. And in this, in this case, that will be absolutely difficult for Putin's regime to stop production. There is no way, way to pump gas. And uh, just you cannot stop exploration of natural gas, but you will continue to supply, even if this, this gas not not paid, like as what happened now by, the, by Ukraine. It's an inevitable operation. And the third, of course, that is that is support of uh, uh, Russian ordinary people, just to continue to ease uh, issuing visas so that they could travel and to see how the United States and other Western countries live, what is the relationship between the state and, and uh, ordinary people, and all the things just necessary to understand what universal values means, mean in practice. Uh, I, think, I think with these, with these uh, all three directions uh, together, we can, we can achieve uh, real changes. Now, just that's a special moment. A special moment when the West consolidated and consistent measures uh, possible and I think necessary. Thank you very much. Mr. Cassiano, thank you very much for those remarks and helping to set the context both of what this crisis means inside Russia <clears throat> but also in the region. Um, I want to pick up uh, a few comments that you've made and then turn to the audience to, to bring them into this conversation. Um, first, could you offer for us your vision of what a healthy relationship, what, what the relationship between Russia and Ukraine should be? Um, even in our own debates in Washington, as there's consideration about what kind of response uh, the United States, the European Union should take in Ukraine, there is a recognition that Russia has a long-standing relationship with Ukraine cultural, historic, religious, economic. Um, describe the nature of what you think should be uh, the relationship between Moscow and Kyiv. Well, first of all, just, uh, and I always stated this publicly, and uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, right way, uh, that priority on foreign policy, Ukraine, that's number one priority on foreign policy. That is absolutely necessary. That's a big state, neighbor, friendly state, and uh, the historical uh, historical roots very close. That's absolutely natural. And we had quite good relations in one period of time. Uh, at that time, I was in power, and <laughs> and that time, and that time, there was a prime minister in Ukraine, um, uh, Viktor uh, Yushchenko. And we uh, just achieved a lot. First of all, we settled all the problems of, of gas debts, which the, the Ukraine didn't pay for quite a period of time. And uh, just we, instead of criticizing and uh, trying just uh, right now, just pressing pay and pay, just created a special program, program of restructuring these debts and uh, support, and support and trade. Mm -hmm. We reduced tariffs so that to make them to make money on the Russian market, just to produce, to sell more, and that was that was good. We have also quite a benefit. We have a number of enterprises in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian enterprises, which produce very necessary products for Russia, and integration of ind industrial integration that, that also um, comes from the Soviet Union time, but today is too. Today, Ukraine has problems 
problems, mostly in all sectors of industry. In uh, heavy industry, in metallurgy, they managed with the uh, big industrials to modernize the enterprises, but um, uh, still they are not uh, not quite, uh, I would say, consistent. But uh, open uh, open trade um, uh, market and free market with uh, with the European Union, I think that also a great benefit. I also thought in that time that uh, uh, Russia would lead, I would say, uh, better integration uh, or closer integration with European Union and uh, Ukraine uh, could also join us and that time we could and that time we were an example a good example for uh, democratic development uh, market reforms but now just of course nobody would like to follow uh, to follow Russian example <laughs> so if you pick up on that issue I mean there's there's some debate in European capitals right now about the EU's approach in the run-up to uh, the Euromaidan, the Vilnius summit, of the association agreements. Um, what was your take on Ukraine's process of, of negotiating an association agreement with uh, the European Union and hearing from Moscow a concern that that actually would mean a weakening, a severing of the economic ties that are deep with, with Russia? The problem is the Yanukovych government made the right thing, just announcing that one of the goal of the policy would be uh, having an association agreement with the European Union. And he even managed to ensure people supporting him in Eastern Ukraine that is the right thing. And majority of population supported that. But then, two weeks prior to signing this agreement, he started to study the documents and understood from the documents and also signals from Moscow from Mr. Putin that this document would kill the whole economy. And just and it, that late stage, he started to say, I wouldn't sign this. It's not the behavior of the leader of the state in the international arena just when they had two years negotiations and after that, achieving already initialing everything just to say, I wouldn't sign that. That uh, bad governing, bad ruling, of course, just maybe uh, it could be, it could be uh, better conditions agreed and, uh, with the better negotiation process, but still, at least the signing the part of it, what has happened now, just political part of the agreement, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, Ukraine is a, is, a, is a member of European Council. All those values which are established in those documents are in constitution of Ukraine. Same in the constitution of in Russia. That's why it's absolutely natural to pursue this way and to produce those laws and to be an association in the political and the civil life. Economic side, that's a little bit more, di more difficult. But they, didn't, they even didn't do this. And he uh, understood uh, that he would face with the problem and he would lose his position. But it happened much faster losing his position because of losing legitimacy of the other reasons. So let me pick back up where you began your talk. Um, and you mentioned you started with 2008 in Georgia. Um, clearly, the actions of the, the West, the United States, and, and Europe <clears throat> failed to deter Putin's consideration of, of uh, further actions in Europe's East uh, in 2008. What will deter uh, President Putin right now what would you be recommending that, that Washington and Brussels uh, consider undertaking? You talked about the sanctions, uh, but are these sufficient to deter an escalation of his objectives, whether it's in Ukraine or Moldova or elsewhere? Uh, the West should press right now just Putin just to make a statement, to make a statement calling the whole these armed groups just to immediately uh, hand over weapons uh, to implement Geneva Agreement. Uh, West should, despite of that, just to enlarge the list of sanctions, individual sanctions. And uh, if it doesn't go this way, then it again would be a feeling that it's possible to perform this way. And then it could be a further invention, even, even in, uh, in uh, uh, Transnistria. Uh, which always considered to be just some kind of um, important point, important territory. Uh, that's, why, that's why just uh, uh, I'm emphasizing that today this very important point, just not to uh, softerize the position, but not to over, over press with the sectorial, sectorial sanctions, but to be every day consistent with the pressing and pressing and, and demanding implementing this agreement. 
Putin pretend he, that he has nothing to do with, the, with the, all these provocations, etc., etc. But everybody knows. And there are a number of already evidence that uh, Russian uh, secret service is working there. That's already just recorded. And the Ukrainian government already provided that. That's, that's the case. And Putin didn't, I would say, uh, cancel uh, in, in a harsh manner that uh, those so-called green men uh, with, with, the, with the guns, uh, that's not, not Russians. He said, yes. Our special armed force just was standing just behind those uh, defenders of uh, in, in Crimea, in particular. Uh, I think that is absolutely clear uh, consistency. That's what uh, the, the only the only recipient. So, so let me turn to your situation in Russia uh, more directly. Um, obviously, we've been seeing uh, reports of Putin's own popularity uh, increasing in the wake of what happened in Crimea. Uh, a consolidation of his, his authority at home and his popularity at home. How do you help this audience understand what's happening inside Russia, the Russian people's reaction uh, to rally around President Putin in the midst of this crisis? And what does that mean for actors such as yourself and your ability to either gain traction in the public debate or even to, to operate as a political uh, opponent, as a political alternative? We just, as David already mentioned, just we already named as a traitors. Uh, few of us who just allow ourselves just to, to describe alternative position. Uh, we don't have access of central television, but Russia continues to be to be a television country, and people in the regions continue to believe if something said on television, it's uh, at least almost true. And that's why, that's why they're under, under intense propaganda, and they absolutely, absolutely uh, have no, I would say, alternative uh, source of information. Of course, in big cities, people just have internet. And uh, in fact, in Russia, there are now 50 million users of internet, 50 million users. Hmm. Uh, but only 10% only, only of that just use internet as a source of information, not just for fun. And uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, I wouldn't say remote, even just not in a up, just those uh, 10 big cities, just all other people living in, a, in such an environment. They, they watching television. And Russian propaganda right now, right now is very technological, I would say very cynical and uh, very sophisticated. That's not as stupid stuff like it was in Soviet Union time. And people just really get up this. And you mentioned also just even internationally, internationally uh, Russian television, international Russian television, creating friends uh, in, uh, in the Western societies, providing those arguments which are simply lie. And it works. That's why people, conclusion is, people just fooled by intense propaganda. And on, of course, as soon as Putin failed with this operation in Ukraine, same people would have an absolutely alternative point of view on Mr. Putin, an opposite. And his popularity will collapse. Let me ask you one more question, then turn to our audience here. Uh, next week, the Atlanta Council is marking, a, we're celebrating the, uh, the, the vision of a Europe whole and free on the occasion of the historic enlargements of both the European Union and NATO. And as you well know, that vision of a Europe whole and free was one that was intended to in include Russia as part of this community. Um, as we grapple with what the future of our strategy, what the future of our policy is, how do you reconcile this, this <laughs> the, the rhetoric and, and the old strategy of a Europe whole and free that was inclusive to Vladivostok, inclusive of Russia it's a, it's really, with the, the situation today? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's really just great to, to reconcile that. Because I remember in, uh, coming back to 2001, uh, after this disaster here in the uh, in, 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 in US, 9-11, uh, uh, we knew how just relations were strengthened between our two countries. And uh, just two presidents, prime minister and vice president and ministers were together this and discussing everything. Just And at that time, we provided immediately all these special special way for logistics, military logistics supplies to Afghanistan. And it was one of the our joint operations there. We didn't want just to come there because of our historical memory, but all others we, we provided immediately. And it was absolutely a great development. And we thought, uh, and uh, Putin said that he didn't exclude 
and future Russia joining NATO. My statement was just, I dreamed that Russia would, would join NATO because just we and, um, have a common, common grounds. Uh, uh, but since that time, lots of changes took place, and especially after the so-called Munich speech of Mr. Putin, when he started to explain that Russia is surrounded by enemies and we should consolidate, and he started to impose his uh, mobilization spirit inside the country. So he squeezed the whole political environment. He closed all parties and uh, uh, started to, to uh, announce all NGOs, um, uh, human rights people as a uh, uh, Western spies, et cetera, et cetera. Since that time, we have great changes. And what's your assessment of why that change took place? Uh, my assessment is that Mr. Putin pretended to be to be democratically devoted leader, <laughs> and then and then just uh, uh, he decided in 2004 and five. Uh, first, it was a Yukos case, and grabbing just the privately owned um, uh, entity to his own uh, friends. And then just trying to, to first to reconsider all privatization, which are redistribution properties. And in fact, that's the main domain wages property, 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 and, uh, and uh, uh, flow of uh, foreign exchange and flow of money, which produce state corporations. And of course, just political instruments is absolutely necessary. Today, maybe that's already going far than that. And uh, Mr. Putin believes he, that he is uh, a leader of the world and uh, existing in Russia forever. But I think just uh, his operation even now demonstrates in the long term a weakness of, of his regime. He's uh, tried to consolidate people just uh, on, uh, with the I would say, threat of, of external enemy. That's what we see now. It means. I'm coming back again, what I already said. If we understand it now, and uh, um, in a, in a solidarity, solidarity manager just um, uh, uh, stand up and stand by, just not allow just to continue this, not to digest what happened, I think the regime will collapse soon, and uh, we adjust the whole situation. Russia will pursue foreign policy based on Russian internal policy, based on universal values. Same what you share here in this country and other country too. All right, with that word, let me turn to our audience and take questions, uh, if I may here. Um, let me take two in the first row, Ambassador Kulazad, and you as well, and then we'll come over here. Um, please, in the front row, and for our television audience, if you could introduce yourself uh, and your affiliation, say your affiliation. Zal Khalilzad from CSIS. I wanted to ask Prime Minister about uh, uh, the role of uh, sanctions, but sanctions beyond uh, financial sanctions uh, in order to deal with the question of deterrence that was raised. Some have argued uh, here in the United States that financial sanctions, although we have become very good at it, uh, it's a very potent instrument now, may not be uh, sufficient, that these have not been sufficient so far and may not be sufficient to deter uh, Putin, that we need to bring some of the more traditional instruments also to bear uh, as, as part of a deterrence uh, strategy, such as strengthening the defenses of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, maybe strengthening uh, uh, the, the, the potential of Ukraine to make uh, Russian occupation, if you like, of Eastern Ukraine should it happen more difficult, and, 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 and confront Putin with the potential for a protracted conflict that that may in addition to financial <coughs> sanctions on him and his uh, uh, close allies may be necessary, uh, 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 leaving aside that the US or NATO should come to the defense of Ukraine because Ukraine is not a member of NATO, but that in the Cold War II, we had frontline states that were not members of the US alliances, but the US had security uh, uh, relationships in order to harden them, if you like, against uh, potential aggression. I wonder uh, 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 how would you evaluate that, uh, that, uh, that kind of thought? First, uh, I think just talking about financial and economic sanctions and sectoral sanctions, whatever, how you call it, I think that will be, and, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it would be productive. First of all, I don't 
want my country would be punished this way and people of Russia. Uh, and secondly, that will produce a reason for Mr. Putin to intense propaganda inside the country and to have a mobilization of the further on, saying just the, the, the West announced the Cold War, Second Cold War. We should forget about our disputes and just to protect our motherland. That will be just in, in a rush manner, propaganda, just etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the sanctions against individuals, I would even say, not even sanctions, but limitation of their, their privileges to go to the United States and the countries of the European Union and to have transactions in the US dollars or just in Euro. That's privilege. And don't let, let those uh, uh, new oligarchs to understand that. And they already understood this. That's why I'm saying just the, I already feel effectiveness of this, that we should continue this way. And that will bring result. But uh, uh, again, talking about Ukraine, the, more, the most important point just to strengthen the, the authorities there, the government, so that they would have a really good uh, elections recognized by everyone. That would immediately, immediately change the whole situation in Ukraine. And of course, of course, just uh, 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 not, not to close eyes or for any, any, I would say, provocation, promotion of unrest by, by Putin's regime in the eastern part of Ukraine. That's absolutely the case. He promoting this, and every day we see on television, and people even in, in, their, in their discussion, in the families, they understand that. Because just even those people who are in Ukraine, they're also talking to their relatives. A relatives talking to other relatives. And for, for Russians, it's not uh, even um, uh, a secret that Russians are there. But as a result of propaganda, they, I wouldn't say applauding, but silently supporting Mr. Putin, although just a normal life, they're against him. That's what uh, happened, unfortunately, this way. Propaganda works very effectively. So a priority more on diplomatic and economic assistance rather than military assistance as the priority. Yeah. Let me pick up this, the question in the second row, please. I'm Timothy Towell, a retired U.S. diplomat. Mr. Prime Minister, that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you. I hope you're right. I th uh, Putin sounds like a real bad guy. I believe in good guys and bad guys in diplomacy, not nuances. Uh, and I hope you're right that he's on his way out. Has the West, for the last 20 years, been playing its hand very well and very professionally. Did we not brag that we won the Cold War as opposed to just applaud a wonderful historical development? I remember studying Marxism about 50 years ago and Lenin warned against capitalist encirclement. Didn't we rush off and play around in Stalin's hometown of Georgia and other places around your country that would alarm lots of people? not just a lieutenant colonel who never made colonel in the KGB. Thank you, and maybe, maybe I'll pick up. I think there was a second question right here. Ariel, please. I'll give you two questions here. Ariel Cohen, the Heritage Foundation. Um, there are probably about three different scenarios in Ukraine right now. One is that somehow, miraculously, uh, Mr. Putin will listen to Joe Biden and pull uh, the little green man and the Russian Spetsnaz back to Russia um, uh, liberate the Crimea and will go to status quo ante. I personally will believe in, in Santa Claus before I believe in that. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, that they occupy um, eastern Ukraine and then force some kind of what they call federalization. Third, they will occupy all the way to the Dnieper River and then go in the south to Nikolaev and uh, Odessa and hook up to Transnistria. And fourth a scenario that pretty much all of Ukraine is going to be occupied. What are the implications of these scenarios for Russia? Uh, are these, um, is, is such a, the, uh, these developments going to change the nature of the Russian state? And if yes, how? And how is it going to change the relationship between Russia and Europe and the rest of the world? Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you take those two, and then yeah. I'll come back to the audience. For general attitude of relations between West and Russia for the last 20 years, I would say uh, 
even for me right now, I'm very much disappointed because, I, in fact, I thought that we already passed communist past, and uh, we'll never come back to such kind of operations. Just in, even in internal life, when just squeezing and putting people in jail and just uh, cutting people from elections and uh, violating of human rights, etc. I've never thought that would, would uh, be in such a, such a scale what we have now. Uh, I think just Western leaders also thought that way, and uh, maybe maybe just didn't pay much attention just to overall uh, developments there and wanted just to engage with Mr. Putin and were even standing on the line of trying to get just profitable contracts. That's the issue and that's a problem, unfortunately. And that's, why, that's why I think just right now we're all reconsidering that. Many of us just supporting Putin in 2000 because we thought that he would continue to build up democratic Russia. And that's why, therefore, I, at that time, uh, accepted, uh, accepted uh, his offer to work together, together with him. And I worked for four years as a prime minister, and in fact, uh, mostly just in, uh, he, prom he, he implemented all promises given to me, just supporting all reforms my government initiated at that time. And we managed to put Russia out of crisis to, to the sustainable economic growth, and we had a GDP growth by 6-7% per year. And uh, uh, the only reform he, he, he uh, didn't support but promised, that's a reform of gas sector. And now we see what is, what is handed up just uh, as, a, as, a, as a military tool uh, pressing other countries um, through supplies of gas. That's why just I think just we all made, I would say, I wouldn't say mistakes, yeah, mistakes too, but uh, we didn't lose. Uh, we have a good good opportunity just to adjust the whole environment, the whole situation. Talking about these scenarios uh, you mentioned, I think my feeling is first, uh, the goal of Mr. Putin at the moment is simply to press West to recognize that his operation in Crimea was legitimate and to recognize Crimea as a part of Russia, to swallow and to digest. And he is going to trade with other points like Eastern Ukrainian regions, like uh, even Russian language, and some other things like 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 gas debt. That's of, of, of the government for uh, uh, utilized gas. I think that's what the goal is. And if you hear Mr. Lavrov every day, he's saying about that. He's saying why West doesn't recognize our uh, right annexation of Crimea. Everything was done in accordance with international rules and standards. And pr pr providing just different, different examples, just et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if uh, Western governments don't perform appropriately and consistently, in this case, just uh, if it's easy to do something more to de destabilize the whole environment in Ukraine, he will be eager to do this. He would be interested in having a weak government there so that his people, his oligarchs, would have more power inside. They already have a lot of industrial assets there. And they control those assets. And they don't want the central government would uh, have uh, just some kind of pressure. They, they would like more environment for their own operations there and to have some kind of subordinated Ukraine. That's what the, the, the goal could be. But I don't think he, the, the, he will start war. That's not the case. But uh, having in mind that he believes that the West, thinking the way that everything could be on the market, everything saleable and purchasable, and he is ready to have transactions. Just when you, the, when he touches universal values like freedom and uh, sovereignty and uh, uh, territorial integrity and human rights, etc. He doesn't understand that, uh, I like to believe, he, he, he doesn't understand that and that the West, that Western leaders are not, not going to trade that. That's why just they stand, up, stand by and will protect those values. Uh, yes, in some countries you can you can see this way, but <laughs> but that's what we would like all to, to be uh, idealistic to the, to be idealists and to, to, to see it as a as a reality.
Mr. Prime Minister, let me collect a couple of questions over here. I want to come to this woman here, and then I'll come to the gentleman on the side. We'll come to the back. Uh, Tatiana Vorashko, Ukrainian Service of Voice of America. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I have a couple of questions I would follow on, uh, follow on the previous question of Ariel. Uh, so uh, Lavrov said today <coughs> that um, Russia would protect um, a Russian interest in Ukraine by all means, and one of them will do the same as we did in South Ossetia, which ended in war. So do you believe, uh, do you really believe that this option of all-out war of moving Russian troops into Ukraine is out. So what you just said is just trading for Crimea. And if it's so, uh, what's, your, what's your feelings? Should, uh, should uh, Ukraine just say, okay, have Crimea and le uh, leave us alone? Do, do you think it's a good idea? And the second, you just uh, said about the sanctions, that sanctions work. But uh, um, I personally believe that uh, Russia can turn into some sort of, of North Korea and um, people will be poor, but uh, North Korea have been blackmailing the world with nuclear weapon for years and, uh, and Russia has, you know, its uh, nuclear arsenal is much bigger. So would sanctions would really work? I mean, can Russia turn into North Korea and just, you know, stabilize this kind of regime? Thank you. Thank you. Let me pick up Harlan as well right here, please. The mic here. I'll pick up both of you. Please, please, this gentleman. Uh, Hannes Adamweit, we'll uh, that's uh, from the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies. Uh, you were mentioning in your presentation uh, the um, uh, EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. Um, I think you are aware of uh, the uh, Yalta uh, European Strategy meeting in September where uh, Sergei Glazev, uh, the advisor to Putin on the Customs Union, uh, in his uh, threats uh, towards uh, Ukraine, uh, mentioned that uh, this idea of uh, joining up uh, with the association agreement uh, was uh, sick and uh, suicidal. Now, in your presentation, uh, you seem to have a, a dim view. So I wonder whether you could clarify what uh, actually the effects uh, might have been of the signature of the association agreement and whether or not uh, also uh, this uh, association agreement uh, and the, the customs union are as um, uh, Russia has contended, uh, mutually exclusive, uh, or whether you see any possibility uh, of um, the, um, any uh, compromise between the two uh, types of organizations. All right, let me pick up a final question here, given <coughs> our time. <coughs> I'm Harlan Owen with the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. In fact, to support your argument about Mr. Putin, I've made the argument he may be a Mikhail Gorbachev in entirely different dress and be perhaps implosive, not immediately, but over the longer term. I wanted to follow up on what you think Putin's view is for the short and longer term. Uh, you have been fairly general in where you think things are heading. I wonder if you could be a little bit more specific. You obviously read his March 18th letter to 18 members of the European uh, community about what he wanted to do. He obviously has leverage over Ukraine in terms of the gas and the money that's being owed. What do you think his immediate plans are? How far do you think he's going to go. What do you think he wants to do about the election? Is he waiting for that or is he going to move before or after? And over the next four or five or six months, do you see this turning into a real crisis for the uh, European and world community or simply a crisis for Ukrainians? Thank you very much. We've right. loaded them up. Given the time, we're going to bring all those questions back to you as a concluding uh, set of comments that take you from uh, all-out war possibilities to the association agreement to Putin's plans. Yeah, first of all, uh, I think just to forget about Crimea, that's not a good idea. <laughs> it's absolutely, absolutely not. Uh, secondly, I think just, yes, uh, uh, Russia, Putin, is not prepared to, 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 to undertake any military operations. Simply, it's a trading. Uh, it, it doesn't mean just you, you shouldn't take it serious, but I think that's an intention to have as a, as a uh, uh, negotiation position, to have something to, 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 give, to give up uh, of achieving the goal. The goal is Crimea, Crimea forever. And just to recognize that's normal. Uh, but again, I don't think just you should forget about Crimea. It's not normal in 21st century to undertake such operations like, like in 17th century. And that is absolutely destroying the whole environment established, established of uh, coexistence of, of the whole world for existing for many years. Uh, on uh, on the plan, uh, on the plan and, and the concrete concrete uh, actions, uh, I think, um, uh, as I said, uh, the 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 whole environment is such that uh, Putin has a lack of legitimacy inside the country, and a, a part of Crimea as a 
getting in history his name as a recollector of Russian land and something like that. And top of this, just uh, to have a consolidation of, of society and his co-electorate and the pop popularity among, among ordinary people and uh, just um, uh, initiating and, uh, and uh, encouraging, I would say, the very low instinct of uh, chauvinism, etc. And that's, that's what right now, unfortunately, is the case. But again, that is uh, absolutely adjustable as soon as, as, soon as uh, uh, there are, uh, I would say, consistent approach, as soon as uh, uh, Russian opposition, which is getting weaker and weaker, uh, but continue and continue to, to, to pursue their own views, alternative view, um, I think that that will work. Elections, of course, of course he doesn't want uh, elections in Ukraine would be would be viewed as a free and fair. He would like to have a uh, poor government, just so that every time to, 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 to claim that he has a right to protect people, Russian citizens or Russian-speaking people, and all the things. We know all, and the OEC mission already reported, uh, I think even the United Nations mission already reported that there was no people were, uh, they, were well, not under any 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 danger, you know, any threat was not any any threat on them. That's why just all these arguments just simply simply lie. There was no arguments to for protection of Russian-speaking people. Uh, elections and uh, in Russia too. I, I think just we already facing the big problem with elections. Uh, we thought that there is some kind of liberalization of this key, of, of the, uh, in this area. Our party was suddenly registered, so it means uh, got access to elections. We participated in two regional elections, got our representatives there in two regions, and today the, the, the Duma adopted another piece of legislation, cutting off us, us of elections, especially and designed this way just that it concerns only our party. It means just again we coming to the to the environment that uh, the instrument which we thought would be just uh, very practical, uh, not uh, through the through the uh, say revolution on the streets, but through normal constitutional way through elections to, to have a, a gradual a gradual uh, changing in, in 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 the whole environment. Just we we lost such such. A, such uh, uh, opportunity. And today, I already made a statement uh, that now just we have only way to consolidate another, to, to create another wave of protest in Russia. It could happen not necessarily tomorrow, maybe in one year, maybe in two years, but people understand. And, and the failure of Putin just to uh, perform appropriately as he promised to people in his propaganda vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine would be another, another failure. And there will be another disappointment of people, and that's what the, would speed up the whole, the whole uh, collapse of the regime. And that's why, that's why, just uh, uh, a lot of different um, circumstances and ingredients we should deal simultaneously. And but in this case, just uh, the Western general uh, position, I would say, uh, principled position, is absolutely uh, necessary. Thank you very much, Mr. Kassianov. There are a lot more questions in the audience, but we have run out of our hour. So I'm going to have to bring this to a close. Let me just first uh, thank you. Uh, and as David Kramer said at the beginning, thank you for um, your own courage in coming here to the Atlanta Council to continue this conversation. Uh, and I will say the Atlanta Council has been a platform for these debates. We had Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov here probably twice in the past 12 months uh, hearing uh, one perspective. We've invited other government, Russian government officials to this stage as well to continue the conversation. We're grateful that you've taken time out of your schedule to come here and offer your, our, your view, your alternative uh, view to Vladimir Putin. Uh, and we're going to continue this conversation in the days and weeks to come, particularly next week. We'll, we'll be convening many uh, of those of you that follow these issues uh, for continuing conversation about what is the future of a Europe whole and free, and where can Russia find its place in that vision and in that strategy. So please join me in thanking our guest, the former Prime Minister of Russia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Bye -bye.